Let's talk about some eye anatomy. Now in this video I'm going to go over some anatomy of the front part of the eye and some of the microscopic stuff you're going to see. Now the first thing you're going to see in an eye exam is the conjunctiva and the conjunctiva is just a layer of tissue that sits on top of the eye and it's clear and it sits right here on the white part of the eye. Now the conjunctiva is not white, it's clear you're seeing the white of the eye underneath and the conjunctiva is a layer of tissue that protects the eye and also creates a surface uh, underneath. It actually loops underneath the inside of the eyelid and forms the back of the eyelids here and explains why if you say have a contact lens that slips down why it doesn't go behind your eyeball it gets trapped by the conjunctiva here and people that get conjunctivitis get a infection of the, this layer of tissue. Now the conjunctiva actually inserts right here at the limbus uh, where it becomes clear cornea and that's the, uh, the front of the eye of course and if we take a picture of this we see uh, here's the limbus and the conjunctiva is a thin layer of tissue here and there's actually little blood vessels running through the conjunctiva and when you get say a conjunctivitis these blood vessels will dilate and get very red and that's why your eyelids pink now the eyelids are actually uh, formed by you could really break it down into two layers there's an anterior lamella which has the uh, the muscles and things like that and there's a posterior lamella which is formed by the tarsal plate. This tarsal plate is a, uh, a layer of tissue that's somewhat tough and uh, gives the eyelids its shape and things like that. And some of the muscles that open and close the eye insert on this tarsal plate. Uh, inside the tarsal plate are the meibomian glands. I've actually drawn this wrong. The glands actually sit inside of the, uh, the plate and they squirt oil through little pores right here at the base of the eyelids into the tear film. And if we take a photo, we can see little pores here uh, right along the edge of the tear of the uh, eyelids and oil is squirted out these, uh, out these pores into the tears and this oil is real important to keep the tears from evaporating too quickly. A chalazion can occur if uh, one of those little pores is clogged up you can get a backflow of uh, lipid into the gland and you can get a granulomatous reaction. It's not an infection, but uh, it is something we see quite commonly in ophthalmology. It's one of the bread and butter things that we see. And people will have a hard lump on their eyelid. It's not tender, it's not infected, but uh, they usually won't go away on their own. And we have to actually flip the eyelid over and use a little uh, scalpel to uh, incise and drain these things. Now that's much different than a sty, which is more like a pimple. It's a little small localized infection, which is usually self-limited, typically red and very tender. The two main eyelid muscles you need to know about are the abicularis, and these are the muscles that are formed in a circular pattern around the eyes and actually close the eye, and it's controlled by cranial nerve 7. So if you have, say, a Bell's palsy where you lose the facial muscles on uh, this side, these patients have a hard time closing their eye and that can create a lot of exposure problems. The other muscle is the levator palpebrae which is controlled by cranial nerve 3 and this muscle is actually a ribbon that attaches to the top of the tarsal plate that we saw before and it pulls the eye open and uh, if you have a cranial nerve 3 palsy then these people have a, a totic eyelid, a very low eye. The mnemonic I use to remember what nerve does what is cranial nerve 3 opens the eye and you can think of that like a 3 like a pillar and cranial nerve 7 closes the eye and you can think of that like a uh, fish hook. The lacrimal system controls uh, the tears and the tear drainage. Now mo the majority of tears are actually uh, produced by accessory glands up in the conj, up in the fornix usually, but uh, a lot of our reflux tearing is produced by the lacrimal gland up here in the corner which squirts tears into the tear film here. The tears then uh, are drained out of small little punctum down a cannulicular system into a, uh, a sac and then down a nasal lacrimal duct where it drains into the uh, inferior meatus which is underneath the inferior turbinate. Here's a video just to show you what those punctum look like. They're very small and you've got two of them, one on the bottom, one on top and uh, here's a close-up video of, of one of them. Here's a, another patient. This one's a little bit more obvious. Now people have different size uh, punctum. Sometimes they don't have punctum. 
uh, people who have chronic dry eyes, we can actually put a little plug inside of this thing and uh, that way their tears don't drain too quickly and that seems to alleviate a lot of their symptoms. Uh, here's a patient who had the, op the opposite. She came in complaining of tearing and under exam you can see that she has an eyelash that's actually stuck uh, in the punctum on that side. So we just pulled that out and her symptoms went away. If you do have a uh, lid laceration, the most worrisome area really is medially because you can cut right through the canalicular uh, structures and this needs to be repaired surgically where we uh, will actually run a tube through the system and leave that tube there for while everything heals up around it in order to keep this uh, this drainage patient. But let's go on to the globe because that's what we're uh, going to be talking about for the most part. The uh, outside of the eyeball is created by the sclera. And this is a type 1 collagen layer, very, uh, very thick, uh, very tough. Well, actually, it's not that thick. Everything's relative because the eye is only about 24 millimeters long, which is about an inch. But uh, the sclera is pretty tough. Uh, the front of the eye is formed by the cornea, and this is the clear area. Now, the interesting thing here is that the sclera and the cornea are both made by the same type of collagen. And the reason the cornea is clear is because, one, it's organized a little bit, uh, a little bit better as, as far as, as how the collagen is arranged. But more importantly, the cornea is uh, relatively dehydrated compared to the sclera. And I'm going to go into that a little bit, uh, a little bit more in a couple of slides. Uh, in the back of the eye, the sclera forms the optic sheath going back to the brain. Now, when I first started studying the eye, for some reason I thought there were two chambers in the eye. There's the back and the front but there's actually three chambers. There's the vitreous chamber in the back, a posterior chamber sort of in the middle. This is between the lens uh, and the back of the iris, and then there's an anterior chamber in the front. Now the uh, vitreous chamber in the back, the posterior chamber, is filled with vitreous humor, which is a jelly-like fluid, and when you're born it has the consistency of jello. It kind of wobbles, it's firm, but as you age you get little pockets of uh, liquefaction uh, where it kind of liquefies, and over time you can get so much that it kind of pulls off the back of the uh, the back of the retina, and this is what we call a posterior vitreous detachment. Very common, almost always harmless, but it's one of those things that uh, can create floaters, and people complain of seeing stuff floating around. It's usually stuff on the back surface of this uh, of this vitreous. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at the rest of the eye. There is, of course, the iris. That's the colored part of the eye. Uh, the ciliary body, which is a mus muscular area, which is actually contiguous with the iris, and the ciliary body does a couple things. One thing it does is it pulls on the lens uh, via these little zonules, uh, and these zonules attach to the lens to the ciliary body in a 360 degree trampoline type arrangement. And when the ciliary body contracts, it actually is a sphincter muscle, so it, it comes this way, and the lens uh, zonules relax and the lens gets rounder and that's how you see close up. Um, the lens itself, you can actually think of it kind of like a peanut M&M. There's a, a hard candy shell on the outside, the capsule, then there's a chocolate layer or the cortex, and then there's a peanut in the middle and that's the nucleus. Now when we do cataract surgery, what we do is we tear a hole in the candy shell in the front, then we run a tool in here that acts kind of like a a jackhammer and breaks up the uh, nucleus and the cortex and then we suck all that out with a vacuum cleaner and then we inject a new implant inside of the capsule uh, where it sits right here um, in the appropriate position. Moving back into the eye, this is a photograph and in this photograph uh, it's somewhat out of focus but what you can see here is a round thing that's somewhat uh, pink and somewhat yellowish but if we zoom in we can actually see that's the retina and that was the optic nerve we were seeing and uh, when you look at a retina, the uh, main things to look for are the macula. That's the central part of your vision, the area that's slightly hyperpigmented. In the center of that is the fovea, and that's the area responsible for the majority of central vision. And uh, has the highest uh, number of cones um, than anywhere else in the, uh, in the retina. And of course, there's the optic disc, and there's a bunch of vessels and things like that coming off. But if we look at a real photograph, we can see the uh, optic nerve is here. The uh, veins and arteries are coming off. The veins are the darker ones, they're slightly larger, and the arteries are the smaller, uh, lighter colored ones. Um, the, uh, there's a small cup right here in the middle of this disc, and when we look at glaucoma patients, we're always talking about their cup to disc ratio, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail um, in other chapters. 
Here's the macula, that's the entire pigmented area. And there's a little divot here which casts kind of a funny reflex, which is the fovea, and that's the uh, part that's important for central vision. Now, the retina looks red in part just because of some pigment cells back there, but it's also in part because of the choroid. And the choroid is a bed of uh, vasculature, uh, blood vessels, that support the retina. Now, the retina is one of the most metabolically active tissues in the entire body. Um, so you can imagine it needs a rich blood supply uh, to give it nourishment and also to, uh, to take uh, waste products away. Now, a lot of anatomy books and people will try to teach you the multiple layers of the retina. I don't think that's real important at this point. Just realize that uh, there's a layer of photoreceptors that's actually quite deep. Now when light comes into the eye, it has to go through the majority of the retina because the retina is actually clear. It goes through a bunch of cells and it hits the photoreceptors. From there, the signal is sent back up into the ganglion nerves and these are the nerves that actually transmit the signal back down the optic nerve to the brain. And of course there's the choroid underneath that's supporting uh, this retina. Now the outer third of the retina, and by outer I mean closer down here, this would be inner, uh, the outer third or so of the retina is supplied by um, the choroid blood supply. And you can imagine that if someone has a retinal detachment that uh, the photoreceptors would, can die quite quickly if they're not attached to this choroid because the detachment happens between these things. Moving on, uh, the eye has a bunch of muscles tethered to it, and these can be quite confusing, so I'm going to break them down into two groups. The first group is a series of four muscles that attach uh, to the sclera of the, of the eye and run back um, to the back of the orbital apex. And these are the rectus muscles, and there's a superior, an inferior, a lateral, and a medial, which is a, a nice naming convention. And uh, they attach back here at the annulus of Zen which somewhat encircles the optic nerve going back to the brain. There's another set of muscles uh, which are more confusing. There's the superior oblique, uh, which runs uh, along the medial wall and inserts back here. And then there's an inferior oblique, which I've actually drawn incorrectly. It doesn't really attach on, on a pulley or anything. It attaches to the orbital floor. But these uh, muscles are more important for turning the eye uh, in more of a twisting motion. And these are the oblique muscles. So the rectus muscles basically do the cardinal directions. I didn't actually draw these cardinal directions entirely true, uh, but for now, we'll just think of it this way.